Y'all know what it is. Once again, another live show. This is the G Podcast, where we focus on family, friends, finances, freedom, and our future, and f everything else. This is the G Podcast, and today we are live with Rob Boy. We getting right to it. Let's go. taking no talk back you see me blink yet y'all already know what it is man we got a real special episode for y'all man the one and only rob boy rob appreciate you for joining us let me take you off the mute thank you for having me i've been i've been waiting for this conversation this it's a lot to talk about <laughs> definitely a lot to talk about man and hopefully just the beginning i know um when i when i reached out originally it was probably the first time I had spoken to you in over a decade. So I want to get right into it from the beginnings. Uh, I, I met Rob. I rem So, Rob, you tell me if I'm wrong. I remember meeting you at Githens Middle School. Do you remember different or what? No, that's exactly. I remember. I can tell you. I can give you all the details because I remember it like it was yesterday. So, OK, please help it, me. It, it was Miss Tyser's geometry class. And... And um, I think I think I think I was in seventh grade and y'all was in eighth grade because it was you and Olivia Money and and I that's all I remember. Brittany, Brittany Jones. So so I actually I think I think see you smart as shit. I was in the one above. So I was in eighth grade algebra, but you was in seventh grade in algebra. I, okay, that's I what it was. That's, that's what, what it was. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now yeah, that you yeah, say yeah. that, yeah, yeah, because I was like, I was not in old geometry at uh <laughs> at get this, was, but there we go. There we was, go. Yeah, you was definitely yeah. two ahead. So there we already get into some of the natural gifts that led to this sort of path here. But yo, I, I appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah, that's correct. Olivia was there, Brittany was there, and I think Brandon was in that class as well. Yep, Brandon mistaken. Douglas. Yep. 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 Word up, man. Shout out to that, man. I'm not. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And so I went to Jordan and you ended up going, I think, to Riverside, right? Or I went to Northern. Northern. Mm, damn. Yo. Northern. I, I, Yo. I, I'm sorry to disrespect you like that. I know. It's I, all good. I, it's all good. Hey. <laughs> hey. None taken. None taken. So just talk about, like, I guess, like, from a Durham perspective, what was it like growing up on the north side? You know what I'm saying? Versus, like, because, you know, Githens was not a north side school. How did you even end up at Githens and go to Northern? Man, crazy. You know, when I was younger, me and my mom, we moved we, we moved around a lot. Mm. Uh, we was, you know, every other year we was moving. And my mom was trying really hard to keep me in the same school uh, because she knew, you know, making new friends and, and you know, just kind of fitting in. She, she was trying to keep me in the same school. So there was a point where I was staying on the south side. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me to Rogers Her and Githens. But we had moved while I was at, you know, Rogers Her. Mm -hmm. And so I was at, at when we was going to Githens, I was taking a city bus every day to Githens and going across town, catching a number, well, from Githens, catching the 17 to the nine. Well, coming from home, catching a nine to the 17. And this is before the, the new terminal downtown. This is yeah, the old, this, yeah, yeah. This the old, this the old, uh, uh, bus station that was on the curve. Uh, That's right at the circle. Yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah, that was that was uh early, and growing up on the north side, it was it's a diff. You know, Durham has its pockets. Yeah. So I was, you know, you know, living with a completely different group of friends that I was going to school with, but it actually helped me hindsight because I know so many people from the city now. Yeah. And and I know, you know folks who went to the Brogdens and the Tunings and Carrington. I didn't go to middle school with them, but I know them because I went to Northern, but I also going across town in middle school. I know, you know, everybody who went to Jordan and Hillside because I went to elementary and middle school with them. Mm -hmm. So I just know so many people from the city because I'm, unfortunately, me and my mom, we was moving around a lot until, you know, high school where, you know, things got a lot more uh, solid a lot more settled so uh so yeah that that's kind of why i was going to get things but living in north durham 
you know, shout out to you, man. You know, I, I had a homie actually had a had a similar situation, and he was definitely uh, catching the bus uh, at early, early ages. He was the first, my homie Ty, when when at Get This, he was really the only other cat I really knew who was like frequenting the bus, bus pass, knew how to get from A to B. Like we was all over, and so. Like what? Like how did like? <laughs> I remember my first time getting on that bus and going downtown, man. And the fact that you was doing it every day, like, like I'm just kidding. Do you got any just like one memory of like, yo, this one time downtown, like when I was at the bus station, like you got one of those Bruh. memories you can share, <laughs> bro. Um, I never forget this. Um, so one day I don't know if you remember QB. Mm-hmm. Me and me and QB was on the bus going downtown because me and QB would catch the data uh, to downtown. And QB was like, d- on that day, he was just kind of like, he was quiet. He was to himself. And he was just different. You know, QB was loud. Mm-hmm. So, you know, QB was just, you know, anywhere he go, any room he in, you know he there. It was just different. And I didn't know, you know, what was up. Like, I just thought he might have been having a bad day. Like, I mean, we spoke, we was cool, but he was just quiet that day. Mm-hmm. And so we get... So we so by the time the 17 is is pulling through uh Brightly Square and getting to the back side of the uh of the bus station, I can see QB looking out the window. I'm like, QB looking for somebody. Like, who are you looking for? And I didn't know, you know, what was going on. And you know, we after like literally seconds, we get off the bus, it's just all hell break loose. And this is mm. big ass fight uh at the at the bus station and he was looking for somebody. Somebody was looking for him. Everybody met up at the bus station. And the, literally the second we stepped off the bus, it was chaos. And, you know, we got middle schoolers, high schoolers. It was just a big brawl. And, you know, of course, you know, police pulling up real fast and in a hurry. Everybody just scattered. I ran on a nine because I was like, I got to get to the other side of town <laughs> yeah. because I, I can't miss this bus. Um, And so I ran on a nine and it. For those who don't know, the nine goes through North Durham, Dow Street, up um, Roxborough, down Club Boulevard, down Dearborn to Bragtown. Mm-hmm. So the nine is one of the routes that, for those who don't know Durham, goes through a blood neighborhood and it ends up in a crip neighborhood. For So it's certain people that you get on and off the nine before certain stops. I was getting on and all my homies was Dow Street, Elizabeth Street, Gear Street. And I would get off and hang out with them or I would stay on because at that point we was living on Dearborn off of Club Boulevard. Mm -hmm. But that was before the nine gets to Bragtown, which is Crip. It was just... Just seeing that that dynamic, you know, seventh, eighth grade early on and, you know, knowing all the people that they tell you to be scared of him. Like, I ride a bus with him every day. We all cool. Like, I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. Big Desmond. Mm-hmm. Uh, Big Desmond stayed on Dow Street uh, and he was going to get things, but he stayed on. He stayed in North Durham, too, like me. So, mm-hmm. uh it was just one of those Dang, scenarios. You bring it up some memories, boy. <laughs> Yo, so you it was just, it up some memories. So it was just one of those situations where. You know, I saw a lot of, you know, the ugly side of Durham from riding the city bus and got exposed to that early. But also, I think that made me more comfortable with just Durham as a whole, because I knew these people that, you know, sometimes you run into them at the mall or something. You're like, oh, that's the person I heard about. I was like, man, I see these people every day on the school. I mean, on the city bus. Like, right. And so and and they knew like they knew that, oh, Rob just played basketball. Like I wasn't really deep into that world i just knew all of them i just knew everybody that i think that gave me a lot of perspective on now i look back and it's fortunately you know a lot of people in that life is gone or locked up and it just makes me appreciate like it just makes me appreciate life because i was just exposed and got comfortable with a lot of things that gave me the ability to communicate with a lot of different people because i understand people's background yeah man i I appreciate i I really appreciate the way you 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 shared the story and then tied it back to like the takeaways from it because i think growing up in durham and, and for those and so for those of those for those watching like this is what we would call that welcome to durham era too like this was um at one point the city was cited in the usa today as the most gang infested if you will city per capita in the whole united states of america like in, in a s- small city like durham the amount of gang activity it was the highest per capita in the whole country According to the USA Today at one point in time. And the way that you described that, man, was, 
you know, so insightful because if you're not from here, you don't necessarily understand like those pockets exist in this in this somewhat smaller city in North Carolina. You know, a lot of us don't even know the difference between Raleigh and Durham, but we're our own city. <laughs> we're not Raleigh. We got our own different, unique culture here. And I appreciate you sharing that, man. And you touched on the the, the unfortunate events that caused sort of the moving early on. Like, how would you just, did you have siblings? Was it just you and your mom? What was the what was the household environment like for you? Uh, it was just me and my mom, and I got a I had a brother, uh, younger at that point he was a baby, and uh, because we're we're ten years apart, mm. so younger like elementary school and you know early in middle school it was it's just me. I think the thing that I, that I got from a lot of just the moving around and I really saw unfortunately you know financial issues and things of that nature which is why we moved a lot early on because my mom was just figuring it out. And I think the thing that I appreciate, though, was that because I was the only child, it it gave my mom more kind of flexibility because it wasn't multiple, you know, I didn't have multiple siblings. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the one thing I think that helped was that I realized early on and I, I had a gift. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't dumb. I wasn't stupid. Mm -hmm. So I think that actually inspire my mom to really figure it out to to figure out how to get me in the right environment as much as possible mm. and not moving me from school to school just because we were moving our address and you know bucking the system like using somebody else's address you know just to keep me in the same school and i, I just learned her the way that she navigated life and navigated those things made me realize there's always a way to do something. There's always a way to make something happen. That's what I took from watching all the sacrifices and the things that she did to try to keep my environment as consistent as possible, even though, you know, we was living in a different place throughout, you know, like throughout my childhood. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, like elementary school, I was actually living in Raleigh. Then we moved to Durham, went to Pearson Town. Then I, we moved while I was at Pearson Town. Um, and, you know, we was just moving like, you know, every two, three years. I think that was the thing that I noticed from her. Like, even though certain things were were not consistent, she did what she needed to do to to give me the most consistent environment, despite, you know, some of those changes. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, I just I just appreciate that. Yeah. Shout out to your moms, man. I can relate to that because like uh, my mom got married around i was like nine going i think i was around nine years old my mom got married and and then and then uh siblings moved into home through the through that marriage but up until that it was me and my mom so i'm curious for you because i was talking to like some family members uh recently and just talking about like the differences of how we grew up versus like how kids grow up now when'd you get a house key i had a house key middle school so that was like that was like sixth grade Sixth grade, you got a house key and you were letting yeah. yourself in and out the house responsible for, sure. for locking the door, closing the door. Yep. Don't because I was don't. getting, yeah, I was getting home way before my mom got off work. Mm -hmm. Like, like she was at work, I would get home. And when I got home, like, well, early on, you know, I stopped doing this, but early on, when I was getting home, I had to get home and call her. Right. So she knows I was at home. Right. And, you know, just in the era of the house phone. Yeah. And, um, and so, and then she would be like, all right, well, you can go back outside. Someday she would say, I could go back outside. Someday she was like, you know, don't open the door until I get there. Right. And, <laughs> and I don't, and so this is, this is the part that, you know, I didn't really think about and, and even talk about until later. I was like, why was it some days where you would say I could go outside? And then there was some days where it was like, you told me to stay in the house until you got home. And she was like, to be honest, because I knew, you know, either certain things had gone on in the neighborhood mm. um, and she like, like literally like stuff on the news. And, you know, I ain't watched the news, but she right. would know like certain things went on in the neighborhood. And Sunday she was just, she just said, I had a hunch. Sometimes I just felt like, oh, Rob, go ahead, go outside, do what you want to do. Someday something just told me, make Rob stay in the house. Yeah. And she was like, I, she just went off her intuition about, about that. Cause I never knew, I never understood like, What's what's the difference between Tuesday and Wednesday? Whether I can go outside while you before you get home from work, and um, and so she was just telling me like it was just most of the time her intuition, or if she knew something was going on in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and just 
felt better with me being inside. Um, mm. And that was early on. Um, and then, you know, by later on in middle school, like get this time frame and into high school, like I was in the wind. Like I, I would be downtown. I would catch a city bus and then I would, you know, be moving around to about five, six o'clock. And then I would, you know, meet, basically meet her at the house by the time she got off work. Yeah. Word. Yeah. See, because this next, this, just, so I think I had my house key third grade. I probably had a house key and was getting off the bus, letting myself in, but I could not open the door. Like you said, like once you get in there, you call, you don't open the door. And I, and I think about like the youth today and the, and sometimes where I would just say the lack of responsibility they have compared to our generation. And in, in, in many ways, some of that's because it's, we had to maybe do things out of necessity. So we had to be more responsible and accountable for, for, the, yep. for, for our actions. But <clears throat> I do think that pays dividends <laughs> later on in life because you, you, you understand consequences you understand like there's a real like cost of doing business, cost of living life and being accountable to each other, uh, like a partnership. So I, I I like to ask like that question to the generation because I, I'm already seeing like a lack of accountability in, in the next generation for their own outcomes, in my opinion, right. in my opinion. Right. And when you grow up in a place like Durham and you have to be self-sufficient, take making sure you take care of the house via your mom's wishes and keep things in order there. Like it does sort of prepare you for life in, I think, a unique way that I'm I'm glad that you were able to make it over the hump to see that. So I guess my question is, being that you grew up where you grew up, how you described it, how did you avoid becoming a part of it? Man, this is a question I think about all the time and, I, and I've actually narrowed it down to what it is. I had so much of a curiosity of what it was like to get out. I don't think everybody had that curiosity. From what I saw, many of us were so intrigued by what we were in and just like, you know, whether it's the superficial things and just, you know, Durham, it's just like, you know, who's doing this? What happened on the other side of town? A lot of us were so entertained because it was so much going on. Still a yeah, lot going on in still Durham. Still a lot, like, yeah. And I was so curious. It's like, man, like, I see something on TV and, you know, you see, you know, other lifestyles. And I'm like, man, like how they live like that or, you know, what you got to do to live like that, which is different from what I see every day. Mm -hmm. And I was just so curious about it that I wanted to figure out how what I needed to do just to get the opportunity to be around, to see something different, to be in a different different space. And I think that curiosity was enough to keep me focused on what I thought was going to carry me out of that situation or one of the things, which is basketball. That was the thing that I saw like, okay, this is something I can really use to, you know, elevate to the next level in life. And it was like, I did it enough to get to college. And then I got to college. And, and for me, college was so important with giving me you know, the real on what it looks like to live life as an affluent black American, mm -hmm. because at Howard University, you just get so many examples of what black excellence can look like. And so hey, what man, I was, you, this ain't no Howard commercial, man. We, no, we no. go if we go do a commercial, it's gonna be for Winston Salem State. Howard get enough money. If we go, if we go you're do right, a commercial, right. it's gonna be for Winston Salem State, man. Hey. But, no, and it's, it's love to Winston Salem State because some of my favorite people went to Winston Salem State. <laughs> no, I'm just so, saying, yeah, you know, I gotta just get that. In. Yeah, yeah, but and then it was like, oh, like this is what I was so curious about. Like I was in classes with daughters or sons of doctors and lawyers. Mm -hmm. I really didn't really get that in Durham. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I'm close to it. And at that point, I'm like, it gave me more belief in my curiosity. And I just wanted to put the pedal to the metal and say, all right, I, I want to take this life thing as far as I can take it. Now that I got an opportunity to get so close to it on a day to day, just sitting in class. And, uh, and so that's the thing for me that was like, I, I knew it was out there and I was curious. And then when I got to Howard, I could reach out and touch it. And the rest was history. So I, I want to ask you a question because like for me personally, I was not, um, I, I would say I had natural gifts in terms of like, I, I am pretty smart, but I was a terrible student, a terrible learner, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Did not take school seriously, never did homework, didn't have the discipline. And I always say, like, it's unfortunate because getting to, say, uh, uh, wherever you go to your undergraduate institution, like, I, I applied to uh, three schools and got into one. Okay. And so I always tell people or when I meet people, it's like, and I, we talk about what that now was like 10 years ago, undergrad. I asked like, well, what was that before that? Because, you know, in hearing your story, you had say every reason to not pursue like, not just like uh, academics, but even like organized sports to some degree. So, but you, you, right. you pieced it together and made it to a great institution like Howard that you don't just, you don't just walk into because you decide you're going to go to college the next day, I guess is my point. What, what type of support did you have academically? Like, I know you, you had some early gifts, but like, I'm curious two twofold question. What type of support did you have academically to help nurture that academic and uh, development over time? Mm -hmm. And then how did you, as a human being, like, I just hate reading and stuff like that. Like, yeah, what made yeah. you even, like, given all the craziness around you, say, actually, I will get into this more than other things? Well, I never was a fan of reading or English. Mm -hmm. So, and that was throughout K through 12. Like, I, I always tell people, I never read a book from beginning to end until I got to college. Oh, me like. Not. Like I never, I, I never. Shout that out. I relate to that. I relate to that. I didn't I read never, it. Over. Like never. So, I think for me, what I I know what carried me, it my ability, like numbers. Numbers mm. was my thing. Like I, I don't know what. Uh, well, I know my my mom liked math, but I don't know what was it about it that it just came natural to me. And kind of right while I was in, you know, algebra with y'all. Right. You was two early, ahead. You was two grades um, ahead because I was one grade ahead. And I never really, like, I was never a fan of homework. So at Githens, so here's a running joke of me at Githens. And I don't even know if y'all knew because y'all was older than us. I was in ISS all the time. <laughs> and it was me and Emmanuel. Sometimes Brian Williams, uh, we was we was in ISS like on, on a regular and Dr. Brian <laughs> Williams. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dr. Brian, Dr. Williams, right? <laughs> and it was because either I was late to English and the English was out in the trailers. You know, I was just not and I wasn't really in tune with, you know, the school thing. Like I just knew I, I was intelligent, but I wasn't really scholastic so when i i think the thing that helped me or carry me to you know college and other things was i tested well mm. like i like i really didn't have the greatest gpa in high school i did enough to be active for the basketball games like i you know i i carried it the way i needed it to so i didn't have to sit in study hall all day or whatnot but my test scores is what 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 got me into the door uh it wasn't my gpa or my regular practices as a student. Mm. It was, uh, fortunately, I tested well. I, you know, I killed the math section of the SAT, which carried my SAT score overall. And, um, and that was what I believe got me accepted into college because Howard was the only place I applied to. Mm. Like I didn't, because, and really? I was, yeah, with my head, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go to Howard, I'm gonna walk on and, I already talked to the coaches when they were down in Raleigh for the MEAC tournament, and I just kind of had my path. All right, like, all I got to do is get in and I can walk on. Mm. And my mom was like, all right, well, you know, you're going to really do this. You got to test well because your GPA is not going to be competitive with the other kind of kids that go to Howard. And she was kind of schooling me on what that looked like because my mom went to A&T. She ain't finished. My mom and my dad went to A&T, but they both dropped out. That's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. But so I'm like, so she was giving me the game like Howard's a tough school to get in, even though it's an HBCU. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to just, you know, do well on the SAT. I'm going to just do well on the test because I knew I was a good test taker. Uh, and so I'm like, all right, let me just focus. Let me do this. Let me do well on this test. And this is going to get me in. And I did well enough. It got me in. And when I did my letter, my like, you know, when you register, not register, when you apply to school and they, uh, they asked like, I, I guess I went through a preliminary step and they asked me to like, they basically asked for me to explain, you know, why I should get into Howard. I, I was kind of like on a bubble. I was kind of on the fence, I guess. Because I was like, yeah, you, you tested well, but you know, your GPA is lower than what we would like. And 
like why she why she, why do you want to go to Howard? I was like, to be honest, you know, I just want to, you know, experience something different in life. And I know I'm intelligent and I just want to be in an environment where I can learn how to really apply myself because I really haven't done that in my life to this point as far as apply myself academically. And they 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 took it, they they liked it, I I guess. And you know, a month later, they accepted me. Wow. And that was, so I, I didn't I never applied anywhere else. I Never got rejected, obviously, from anywhere else. And that's why I really think it was just meant for me to go that path. And um, and so I'm just so grateful because, you know, that that was really the only option to get out of Durham. Because mm -hmm. who knows what I, what my life would have turned out to be if I didn't go to Howard. And I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I don't you never know. I might have gone, gone to Durham Tech or something. I don't know. Uh, no, no disrespect to Durham Tech, but I would have done something in Durham. Probably trying to, you know, move my life forward, but I I have no idea what that path was because I didn't even think about plan B. I was right. like, no, they're gonna accept me. It's gonna work. I just has blind confidence that 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 path was gonna work and it did. At that moment, are you thinking about what you're going to major as well? Or are you just thinking about I'm gonna walk on to the basketball team? Bro, I knew I could draw. I was like, they got any majors with drawing? <laughs> and <laughs> No real talk. My first major was architecture. Word. Because I in, in high school at Northern, I took a drafting class and I was in drafting class going crazy. Like yeah. I was drawing all kind of stuff. Like the teacher was like, Rob, you should really get into art. And I'm like, all right. I was like, can I go to school for that? And so I was literally went to Howard <laughs> and I was looking through majors. <laughs> I was looking through majors. Oh, that's and hilarious. Because I was like, I'd rather draw than read. Yo, this is so, exactly how yo, I remember thinking the same thing. Well, I, I didn't want to go to college if I can't study PE. Shit, that seemed like the best shit to do. Like, look, I was in the same mode, man. Look, look. And, and I literally, first semester at Howard, my major was architecture for that very reason. Mm. Um, And that, I realized, like, that was actually more work than a lot of other majors that I seen and I, I was only there, I was only in for a semester and I was like man my the people over in the school of communications they having fun over there mm. let me get me a communications major and I swapped and I went over to the school to see because they was just all they was on the radio like they was running going around school with towels like it just seemed like they was having fun mm -hmm. and I'm like let me go over and change my major and go over there and that's where I uh started to uh, my my major in communications management and in communications management you have to pick a minor and I was like what's a minor like well like what's what's this like y'all throwing this extra stuff at me like what's a minor yeah so it's basically they were like you got to concentrate on something that's like secondary to your major and I'm like okay when well, I'm looking down the list and I literally randomly picked economic mm. and I'm like let me shout out to the econ and... majors man yeah and I took. I took that first Econ 101 or Econ 01, whatever it was called. Was it micro? It, I think it actually was macro. Mm. But whatever it was, I was like, this easy. Yeah. And everybody in the class was like, struggling. You get this stuff? Right. I'm yo. Like, <laughs> no, like, this is just some numbers and some stories. Supply? Like, demand? What the f? Yeah, like, this is just numbers with a story with it. <laughs> and. I literally aced all my econ classes and everybody was like, you know, I was the person that was handing out all the answers. Like I was like, oh, this is my thing. Right. And I just I went hard in econ. It became a double major for me. And because I just took so many of the classes because it came so easy to me. And uh, and that's where I really figured out like, oh, I, I can actually do this financial stuff because these econ classes is big to me. Like mm -hmm. this, this is what this is. It's way too easy. Like this is, I don't even have to study. Like yeah. I was not studying and I was ace in tests and nobody understood like my business partner today, Ashley Fox, we started Amplify together. We're going to talk about that. But we met because she was completely blown away by the fact that she saw that I didn't study and saw that I was acing the test. And she was like, Rob, you smart. You know this stuff. And that's what we both realized. We had some kind of passion for finance and business business partners to this day. That's dope, man. <clears throat> and I'm happy that you shared that story because I fell into econ as a double major at Winston. I started, but and, it, and, and it's so many, like, whether it be disciplines like economics, 
you know, I, I compare it to that scene in The Wire when when Stringer Bell was taking his uh, econ class so he could figure out the market for his products. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. the, the the environments that we grow up in, you, you'd be surprised at how those skills not only translate to something like economics, but also just like the world of business in general and the mindset needed to be successful in a capitalist America. Like it's, it's, it's all like a great skill set that you nurture and develop, but not everyone gets to like, then take that skill set and apply it in the, in the, on the battlefield, if you will, to make a living and, 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 and show and demonstrate. And so <clears throat> the fact that you fell into econ is like, I can relate to that so much, but it's like, okay, so you, but you went there for basketball. So did you hoop at Howard at all? Or like, like, did you did you do that for all four years? I'm curious, like, yeah. At what so, point did you sort of separate or and just be like, ah, like, yeah? What was that like giving up the hoop dream, if you will? Yeah, no. So uh, Howard has his traveling team, 1867. Shout out to 1867, and uh, we was one of the only HBCUs that had a fully funded traveling team that was pretty much treated like the JV, to the the uh, main team, and so mm -hmm. it was always where players got pulled up from that team to play on the team. Mm. And so I did that for three years mm. and that was like, it was to, to me, it was like the best of both worlds. Cause we traveled on planes, buses going all over the country, uh, playing some of the larger PWI schools, um, beating them. And it was just, it was just a great experience. And to be honest, we was winning more national championships than, you know, our main team wasn't even winning the MEAC tournament at the time. Right, now, right. you know, Howard basketball is on point these days, but, you know, back then it wasn't. And so we was, you know, coming back to campus with trophies and everybody was like, man, 1867 is, is the squad. Like they, they handle business. So that was, uh, that was a great experience. And, you know, I met so many of the alumni because when you're on that team, you have to take a lot of leadership roles with events on campus. Mm -hmm. So graduation we have um we have something called uh well it's basically commencement but also something called charter day which is you know when howard university was chartered uh may 3rd of every year i mean excuse me march 3rd of every year but at that event all of the basketball players are like ushers for this alumni event and i met some of the most prominent howard alumni because i was captain of that basketball team and just had so many responsibilities where you know, the the big names you hear with Howard alumni, I was talking to him, meeting them. I was 19, 20, 21. Like, man, like, dang, that's that person. And that's that person. Yeah. He runs this and he runs that. And it started, my wheels started rolling like, hold on, in a couple of years, I'm going to be an alumni. So I'm kind of like him or I'm kind of like her, just younger. And it really just stretched my belief in myself. It's like... Mm. I'm in a, in a space, I'm on a path to become that kind of individual that has an impact on the world in business or philanthropy or whatever those individuals are being honored for. And I'm now talking to them. I'm making sure they, you know, move from room to room and they're telling me about their careers and I'm locking in internships and, you know, getting references for certain things just from, you know, having that role uh, in some of those events because I was on the basketball team, which I was kind of forced to be ushers at events, but it actually gave me the opportunity to network and meet a lot of prominent people and the president of the universities. It was just really dope, uh, just what I got exposed to in that space. And so when basketball came to an end, I didn't feel like I was losing anything because I gained so much while I was playing. Yeah, that's dope. So I knew what was next for me. If I didn't know what was next, I would have felt like basketball was a loss when I stopped playing. But because I knew professionally and going into the world and graduating and having a job lined up because of some of those very networking opportunities I had while I was playing, <laughs> like because I knew what was next, I didn't feel like the end of the basketball life was something that really affected my identity. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And I and I think we do need to highlight just for, for the listeners watching, especially any younger folks who catch this. Like if, if there's one thing, if I could go back to undergrad and redo over, I did not network. 
I didn't even have a game plan after getting out of school. I was only just thinking about getting grades and graduating. I didn't have any foresight to be thinking about really like setting myself up for certain careers, pursuing certain internships, like figuring out how to leverage my time at the university to establish bridges to cross in the future. I, I think that if you don't get anything else from your undergraduate experience, you want to make sure you're putting yourself in rooms and 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 putting your name in the mix to to do as much as you can just to meet people and and not turn down things like not have that self-limiting belief in your head for your own shortcomings of where you came from and what you maybe haven't been exposed to like be be comfortable being uncomfortable and allow yourself to experience these things cuz you never know why, what might be on the other end and so when it comes to leaving Howard, like I like I know where you are now, but like what was your ser first sort of like financial experience? Like, how did you even get into this financial education expertise? Like, where did that even begin? Um, so first job out of Howard, I was in economic research. The I guess the gift that I knew I had was just numbers and finance that had been bubbling throughout my entire, you know, high school to college. Well, just math classes, just pretty simple to me that in that first job, the, when the light bulb went off that I know how to explain this stuff, I just don't know this stuff and you know, can do my job. I know actually how to explain it came from a scenario where I put together this whole extensive uh, research report about real estate in Chicago. And that was like the market I was covering and I was doing research on. And when I put this whole report together, my manager was like, no, this is a great report, but our clients, they're, they don't know economics. They, I mean, they're, they're not going to know how to read this report because it's got a lot of big words and charts and stuff like that. They just need to know how to make some decisions based on this information. So I was like, oh, I'll just explain it to them. And so when he looked, he looked at me, he was like, you sure about that? I was like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just explain this. Like, what are you talking? Like, I yeah. put it together. I'm like, I can explain it. Like, what, what, what's the issue? I didn't, I didn't understand what his right. You doing his, a whole different role now. You going from analyst to consultant. Yeah. So he was like, all right, let's get him on a call and send them the document. And you know, you can just, you know, give them the, the, the takeaways and, and you know, the major points. Man, we did that call. They. Every person that we did that presentation to called me back the next day like, Rob, like, I really want to thank you. Nobody's ever explained this to me. And these are multi-million dollar real estate developers calling me as an analyst, thanking me for how I explain this report to them and how they're going to be able to make some decision from it. Not just one or two, but it was multiple, like five, six, seven people. And here I am, 22, 23 year old analyst that they didn't call my manager. They called me because I would just seamlessly and easily broke down this information and explain to them so that they could make some decisions. And at that point, I was like, hold on, like my manager don't even know how to explain this stuff. Mm. I, but I do. And I was like, maybe I don't just know this stuff. I know it well enough to communicate it, which is where my communications major came into play because I know how to communicate. That's where I realized my double major of communications and economics was actually going to help me guide people with money and numbers, not just read and understand numbers. Mm. And that was the first instance where I was like, hold on now. I can take this a lot further because I'm realizing everybody doesn't know how to explain this stuff. A lot of people know how to analyze it, crunch some Excel spreadsheets, but it's fewer people who actually know how to explain this stuff to somebody who doesn't do this. And and for people listening, when we say explain this stuff, like what when we talk about like as if like we're talking to, for, to somebody who has no clue to explain stuff we talking about interpreting data like what does explain this stuff actually mean man interpreting you know financial trends understanding how interest rates affect real estate understanding how the stock market um is affected by you know the different decisions made by different countries and you know understanding all the things from how much money it costs to borrow to, you know, get debt and the things that we think about, like interest rates, explaining those things, but also how they control or connected to other things related to assets like stocks and real estate and explaining to someone who 
has no uh, deep understanding of all these different what they call capital markets and say, all right, I can tell you and I can break it down. When this happens over here, this is going to happen over there. Mm -hmm. And they might be two completely separate industries. But I can explain how everything is interconnected mm -hmm. in a way where someone who's, you know, thinking about selling a building a year from now, and I can tell you, well, based on how interest rates are trending, you might want to sell that building now and don't wait a year unless you want to, to lose out on half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And being able to not only explain the connection, but explain the trend and the numbers I'm looking at that give me that insight so that you can make decisions in your industry because you didn't know something in a completely different industry was going to affect your decision making. That kind of data and just looking at different financial factors in the world from banking to stock market to real estate and how things in those different industries affect each other. Mm. Okay. I appreciate that insight. And so <clears throat> in listening to you, your first sort of experience was with the Chicago real estate market. And cool. I know I've seen you on social media talk about REITs. Mm -hmm. Is there any correlation between that experience and your expertise in the field of, I guess, and, and for the people who don't know, can you get tell us what a REIT is? And is that for sure. sort of the bridge to you being a subject matter expert as it relates to those? Definitely. So I didn't know what a REIT was until I had that first job out of college and I was doing economic research and I saw these companies buying up skyscrapers, buying up malls. And I'm like, what are these companies that are buying multi-million dollar properties just at a snap of the finger, showing up with 40, 50, 60 million and just buying properties? And, and it was just almost like looked like a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I first got exposed to that there are companies out there called REITs, which is short for a real estate investment trust. So it's a designation that a company can have that owns real estate or owns portfolios of real estate in which this designation allows you to forego paying corporate taxes as a company simply because you have agreed to share all of your profit with your shareholders instead of keeping it um, and not you know, paying it out because you are allowed to forego corporate taxes. And so I first came into contact or knowledge of these companies at that first job. And I was so intrigued that I went to Georgetown and got a master's in real estate finance because I really wanted to learn how these companies or developers were financing multi-million dollar deals when I'm from Durham. I never seen this kind of money. Right. I right. Ain't never seen these these amount of zeros. Right. And just people, you know, picking up the phone saying, Yeah, I want to buy that. Yeah, I just sold that. And I'm seeing six, seven, eight zeros, eight digits on transactions. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't need to learn how this works because I just explained to the guy who just sold a building. I explained to him why he should sell it now than later. And he trusted my insight and he just made who knows how much money. But I'm the one who was who explained to him why and when and what he should do next. I'm like, whoa, I need to understand how to be in his seat because he needs me to make this decision. Mm -hmm. But I'm sitting here making $50,000 a year as a researcher when, you know, he just made 50 million in one swoop. At that point, I'm like, what are these REITs? Went to, you know, get a master's in real estate finance at Georgetown while I was in DC, learn more about them. And I was like, oh, everybody got to know about this because anybody and their mama <laughs> can get a piece of these. You don't need a credit score. You don't need thousands of dollars. You can start small and you can own a piece of the portfolio. How small can you start? There are shares of top REITs that are anywhere from $30 to $50 per share. Those, when you invest and buy a share, so a share for those who might be unfamiliar is when you buy a piece of ownership of a company. So you can buy as many pieces as you like and the more pieces of the company that you own that are called shares, the more you're going to earn, the more dividends you're going to earn because you get paid per share that you own. Once I realized that this was a path for individuals who maybe didn't have the strongest credit, didn't have thousands of dollars to start with, but wanted a path to passive income that was supported by 
the biggest and best real estate properties in the world and then you're not making income from you know the eight unit apartment on the other side of your hood these are companies that own 300 unit apartment buildings their own skyscrapers their own malls and because you own a piece of the company they have to share all of the rental income that they make with you because you're part owner because you own shares of the company and so once i learned that game and learned that that was a path for you know middle america to get into a space where you don't have to worry about being a property manager you don't have to worry about your credit but you can chip your way to a point in which you can have a passive income that frees you from working and frees you from a lot of the things that we might think okay i gotta work till i'm 60 i gotta work till i'm 70 and we can change that reality with something that's based off something that we understand and conceptually understand as far as real estate that's where i realized reits would be a great solution for millions of people and me knowing that information i didn't want it that you had to go to georgetown you had to have the job that i had to be exposed to them and i was like rob you know this stuff and you can share it with people and you know how to explain it go and take that as far as you can take it because everybody has the right to know this information that can completely change the game with their financial future and that was like 2013 to like 2015 i was when when i really mastered you know understanding what REITs are and then over the last seven or eight years we've been building a company around de delivering this information and now over the last couple of years using technology to deliver this information to people all over the world through an app um and this is just one of the things that i personally have a passion for simply because i i fell into it naturally through my job right out of school and I just kept building on what I understood about it till I got to a point where, you know, I know these things through and through and now can educate someone on how to make decisions with investing in them, even if you have no background in investing at all and you're learning from scratch. Yo, that is very <clears throat> like, you know, the thing here I got to really highlight is the access to information part, which I have a, has been like a reoccurring theme on the podcast because... I talk about growing up in Durham and not even knowing what RTP really was, for example. Right. I ended up working at the science and math. Didn't even realize the best science and math. Hi, did you as a as a STEM guy, did you have any visions of going to science and math or did you or did you know about it when you were there? I knew about it. Okay. I didn't even know about it till like a year before I started working there. A, a homie of my homegirl was working there and I was like Oh, what? And that's what that is on Ninth Street and Club. Like I had no clue that was that was one of the best, you know, science and math high schools in the country. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, a lot of people, they do talk about the value of education, but they don't really talk about the value of knowledge that comes with that price tag. Everything has a cost in some sort of way. This is economics now. We're talking like everything has right. a cost, but right. monetarily expertise is the arguably one of the most expensive things that you can pay for that you can put a price tag on any type of expertise it's going to cost a premium getting access to that expertise should be treated as an as one of your first initial self investments in life like like the fact that you saw something and then realized actually I'm going to go to school get a masters and make sure like I'm getting the information I need to go to the next level like this is where I say we should not always pull poo higher education because while it is ridiculously expensive mm -hmm. while it is outrageously selective and unfair mm -hmm. and it's been you know uh privatized under a business model versus a model of actually teaching and educating those criticisms are fair things that you can unlock because of your access to the knowledge is so priceless and you invested in that first without even necessarily knowing what was coming but you invested in yourself and that hunger to learn more i gotta highlight this because if you aren't willing to spend money on yourself to take you to the next level right. when will you ever be comfortable investing in something else you know like you you at For least sure. gotta spend that money on yourself and so i, I gotta highlight that that point but before we we, we close out i just want to I, I know there's a lot we didn't necessarily get to but i know the impact of your story like man i'm glad we were able to capture that 
I'll, I'll be curious to hear, like, you you talked about how you've come together and create the technology. Can you give us a little bit of overview of what that technology looks like and what you and your business partner have come together to create? Yeah, for sure. So many of our members or users call it the Netflix of finance. Mm. And it's an app that has hours of tutorials and educational videos about all of the elements of personal finance you can think of from debt management, understanding life insurance, understanding the stock market, understanding retirement plans, even things around personal development, money mindset, all of these different things that are not uh, in, an, in an organized educational learning path for many of us coming through K through 12 or even in college where these things aren't necessarily taught formally. And we've compiled relatable and culturally relevant content about these topics into an app that pretty much operates as a database of information. And when it's a database of videos and viral content so that the person that's, you know, experiencing the content can watch it, can listen to it, we even have written content you can read through. And it's just a basis of financial education because one of the things I learned throughout my career, I spent three years as a financial advisor, was that most of the clients that I work with made anywhere from $30,000 to $80,000 a year. And most advisors do not talk to clients in that in that profile, they're trained to talk to those who make 100,000 and up. Mm -hmm. So in that niche of being successful as a financial advisor, talking to what they would call middle America, I realized that I spent most of my time educating someone about money before they were making decisions around life insurance, investments, and things of that nature. And it dawned on me and my partner, Ashley, it's like, we spend most of our time educating as advisors. Why don't we just go into financial education, which is where we ultimately ended up and made this app where it's a uh, 24-7 access to that information. It's called the Wealth Builders Community. And it's available, you know, Apple iTunes Store, Google Play Store. And it's simply a community because it also has functions of a social media platform where you can connect and talk to other members and network and meet business partners, meet people in your area that are like-minded, who want to learn more about money, who want to build wealth, want to understand how to start that process, uh, are coming from you know generational cycles of indebtedness and wanting to break those cycles. And it's a community where you can connect with people, get access to the education and information that's not formally taught in many education systems uh it's something that is accessible globally we have members in 24 different countries and uh we make you know, all, of, all of our content accessible uh across the world we have members in africa europe south america uh, most of our members are here in america across 48 different states nice. and we we just wanted to build an environment where it was no judgment uh, we have members from 19 to 80 years old. It's a wide range of people. I'd say the majority of our members are between 30 to 50. And they're just learning things to take their family to the next level and being educated so that when they talk to an advisor or talk to a financial professional, they know they understand the lingo. They know what they're asking for. They go in with an agenda of what they need instead of sitting there and hoping that person tells them something that they need, they go in educated and more confident about their financial decisions. And our goal is just to make sure you are more confident with all of your financial decisions that will probably lead you to building wealth for future generations. Man, that is an awesome, like the, 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 the mission, the fact that you're incorporating the tech, making it an app, like you understand where things are moving just from a business perspective. Um, I just want to mention in the description, we do have a free takeaway for the good folks who tune in and catch the interview. Can you talk a little bit about that free takeaway that you're offering? So I'm, I'm going to tell you all this, and this is real. I personally wrote a guide. Uh, it's about, I'd say it's probably about five, five, maybe six pages. So nothing extreme. It's the basics to what a REIT is and how you can begin investing them as a beginner and making sure that you know that there is a viable path to starting to create passive income that doesn't require thousands of dollars to start. Mm. And, and it's a free guide that we're making available to anyone who wants to download. It's a PDF. And for those who download it, we'll make sure you get resources to other 
freebies and other things um, that we have available. Uh, but it's one of the most recently uh, written. I, I probably wrote that guy maybe about two months ago. We just published it uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it was fresh information, um, very relevant to the times now. Uh, and it's also we got to make sure I say that because you know, we've heard talks about recessions and high interest rates right. and it's information that is still applicable in the moment and a way for you to get a return on your investment despite the economic conditions that we're seeing right now because it is based, REITs are owning commercial properties that yes, you know, there's things in the financial world that are going wrong, but many of the companies that occupy these buildings are still paying rent and you are still earning a dividend despite all the things happening in various sectors of the of the financial world. Man, I appreciate you offering the, the, the listeners and watchers that free resource. The link is in the description in case you need access. We're going to go ahead and close out here, Rob. Uh, is there any sort of last words here that you want to leave with the people before we get out of here? So I got to I got to plug myself really quickly. Please. So do. you all heard Let me the get story you the full of screen. <laughs> you all heard the story over the last hour or so. I'm telling you directly from me to you that I am the best re-educator in the world. Not because I set out to do that. Because it doesn't I just, matter how you feel. I took advantage of every step and every opportunity presented to me, which landed me in a space. I was the main one talking about these things and one of the main people pushing for you to understand and Edu get educated and learn about them. And with the technical background from economic research and the master's in real estate finance to all of the things I've done in the financial world on the investing side as an advisor, I'm fully aware of many of the investments out there. And I'm telling you right now that REITs on average have the best returns in, re in relation to dividends than many other investments on the stock market. And I talk from A to Z and educate from A to Z on what they are, how to understand them, how to confidently invest in them. Um, and you will very rarely come across people who have the background that I have with REITs. And I just wanted to make sure that you know that and know that I wanted to pass that information on, that knowledge on to you so that you can run with it because it made no sense for me to just keep it. I'm not taking so, no talk back. So that, that, that's the, the, the thought the mission and the vision behind, you know, this guide that you can download and a lot of the other things I'll be talking about over the next month or so on social media, because we're, we're circling back around to one of our most prominent uh, learning experiences that is available to the general public. Uh, on, and we're going to be talking about a lot on social media over the next month. And it's just an opportunity for you to be alongside hundreds and thousands of people learning about this. And I'm literally the person that's going to teach you. So you're getting it from the source. Man, shout out to Rob Boy. Shout out to Amplify. Shout out to the Wealth Builders community. This is the G -Sh Podcast where we focus on family friends, finances, freedom, and our future, and f everything else. This is the G -Sh Podcast. This was G -Sh Live featuring Rob Boy. We greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate y'all watching. Make sure y'all check the link in the bio. Get that free resource so you can learn about these REITs and get that passive income going. This is the G -Sh Podcast. Hi. I No talk back.